dwarves stop beneath a tree and sniff, his gray-brown fur dappled by shadow. A <coughs> sigh of piney wind brought the man scent to him. Over fainter smells, he spoke of fox and hare, a seal and stag, a wolf. Those were man smells too, the dwarf knew. The stink of old skins, dead and sour, near drowned beneath the stronger sense of smoke, blood, and rot. Only man stripped the skins of other beasts to drape themselves in their hides and hair. Wargs have no fear of man, as wolves do. Hate and hunger coiled in his belly like cold black worms, and he gave a low growl, calling to his one-eyed brother, to his small, sly sister. As he raced into the trees, bounding toward the man smells, his packmates followed hard on his heels. They had caught the scent as well. For a moment, as he ran, he saw through their eyes, too, and glimpsed himself ahead. The breath of the pack puffed warm and white from long, gray jaws. Ice had frozen between their paws, hard as stone, but the hunt was on now, the prey ahead. Flesh, the Lord thought. Meat. A man alone was a feeble thing. Big and strong, with good sharp eyes, but dull of ear and deaf to smells. Deer and elk and even hares were faster. Bears and boars fiercer in a fight. When in packs were dangerous, though. As his pack closed on to prey, the warg heard the wailing of a small pink pup, the crust of last night's snow breaking under clumsy man paws, the rattle of hard skins, and the long gray claws men carried. Swords, the voice inside them whispered. Spears. The trees had grown icy teeth, long sharp fangs that snarled down from the bare brown branches. One eye ripped through the undergrowth, spraying snow behind him. His packmates followed, up a hill and down the slope beyond, until the wood opened up before them and the men were there. One was female, and the fur wrap bundle that she clutched was her pup. Leave her for the last, the voice within him whispered. The males are the danger. They were roaring at each other as men did, but the war could smell their terror. One had a sharp wooden tooth as tall as he was. He flung it, but his hand was shaking and the tooth sailed high. Then the pack was on him. His one-eyed brother knocked a tooth thrower back into a snowdrift and tore his throat out as he struggled, while his sister slipped behind the other male and took him from the rear. That left the female in the pump for him. She had a tooth, too, a little one made of bone, but she dropped it when the wolf's jaws closed around her leg and wrapped both arms around her noisy pup. Beneath her furs and leathers, the female was just skin and bones. Her dugs were full of milk. The sweetest meat was on the pup. The wolf saved the choicest parts for his brother. All around the carcasses, the frozen snow turned pink and red as the pack filled its bellies. In league's way, in a one-room hut of mud and straw with a thatched roof and a smoke hole and a floor of hard-packed earth, Vatimir shivered and coughed and licked his lips. His eyes were red, his lips cracked, his throat dry and parched, but the taste of blood and fat filled his mouth. Even as his swollen belly cried out for nourishment, the child's flesh, he thought, remembering bump, human meat. And he sunk so low as to hunger after human meat. He could almost hear Hagen growling at him. Men may eat the flesh of beasts, and beasts the flesh of men, but the man who eats the flesh of man is an abomination. Abomination. That had always been Hagen's favorite word. Abomination, abomination, abomination. To eat of human meat was abomination. To mate as wolf with wolf was abomination. And to seize the body of another man, that was the worst abomination of all. Hagen was weak, afraid of his own power, and he died weeping, weeping and alone when I ripped his second life from him. The hunter was thirty years dead. Varamir had devoured his heart himself. He taught me much and more, and the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. That was as a wolf, though. He had never eaten the meat of man while in his own skin with human teeth. He could not grudge his pack the feast, though. The wolves were as hungry as he was, gaunt and cold and starving. And the prey, two men and a woman, a babe in arms, fleeing from defeat to death. They would have perished soon in any case from exposure or starvation. This way was better, quicker. Mercy. Mercy, he repeated aloud. His throat was raw. It felt good to hear a human voice, even his own. The stale air smelled of mold and damp, and the ground was cold, cold and hard. His fire was giving off more smoke than heat. 
He moved as close to the flames as he dared, coughing and shivering by turns, his side throbbing where his wound had opened. Blood had soaked his breeches to the knee and dried into a hard round crust. Thistle had warned him that might happen. I sewed it up the best I could, she'd said, but you need to rest and let it mend or the flesh will tear open again. Thistle had been the last of his companions. The spear wife, tough as an old root, warty, wind-burned, and wrinkled. The others had deserted them along the way. One by one they fell behind or forged ahead, making for their villages, or the milk water, or hard home, or a lonely death in the woods. Baromir did not know and could not care. I should have taken one of them when I had the chance, he thought. One of the twins, or the big man with the scarred face, or the youth with the red hair. He'd been afraid, though. One of the others might have realized what was happening, and then they would have turned on him and killed him. And Hagen's words had haunted him, and so the chance had passed. After the battle, there had been thousands of them struggling through the forest, hungry, frightened, fleeing the carnage that had descended on them suddenly at the wall. Some of the survivors had talked of returning to the homes that they'd abandoned, others of mounting a second assault upon the wall. But the truth was that none of them knew where to go or what to do. They had escaped the black-cloaked crows and the knights in their cold gray steel. The more relentless enemies stalked them now, and every day left more corpses by the trails. Some died of hunger, some of cold, some of sickness. Others were slain by those who had been their brothers in arms when they all marched south with Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. Mance Raider had fallen, the survivors told each other in despairing voices. Mance was taken, Mance was dead. Arma's dead and Mance is captured. The rest run off and left us, Thistle had told him as she was sewing up his wound. Corman, the weeper, six skins, all of them brave raiders. She does not know me, Varamir had realized it. And why should she? Without his beast beside him, he did not look like a great man. I was Varamir six skins, who broke bread with Mance Raider. He had named himself Varamir when he was ten. A name fit for a lord, a name for songs, a mighty name and fearsome. If he had run like all the rest, run from the crows like a frightened rabbit, and he could not bear to have the spear wife know that the terrible Lord Baramir had gone craven. Instead, he told her that his name was Hagen. Afterwards, he wondered why that name had come to his lips of all those he might have chosen. I ate his heart and drank his blood, and still he haunts me. One day, as they had fled, a rider came galloping through the woods on a gaunt white horse, shouting that they all should make for the milk water, that the weeper was gathering warriors to cross the Bridge of Skulls and take the Shadow Tower. Many followed him, four did not. Later, a Dur, warrior, and fur and amber went from cookfire to cookfire, urging all the survivors to head north and take refuge in the Valley of the Fens. Why he thought they would be safe there when the Fens themselves had fled the place, Varamir never learned, but hundreds followed him. Hundreds more went off into the woods with a woods witch who had vision of a fleet of ships coming to carry the free folk south. We must seek the sea, she proclaimed, and her followers turned east. Naramir might have been amongst them, if only he'd been stronger. The sea was gray and cold and far away, though, and he knew that he would never live to see it. He was nine times dead and dying, and this would be his true death. A squirrel skin cloak, he remembered. He knifed me for a squirrel skin cloak. The woman had been dead. The back of her head smashed into a red pulp, cut with bits of bone. But she wore a squirrel skin cloak. It was snowing, and Baramir had lost his own cloaks at the wall. His sleeping pelts and woolen small clothes, his sheepskin boots and fur lined gloves, his store of mead and hoarded food, tanks of hair he took from the woman he bedded, even the golden arm rings Mance had given him, all lost and left behind. It burned, and I died, and then I ran, half mad with pain. Error. The memory still shamed him, but he had not been alone. Others had run as well, hundreds.